Hello everyone. We have a new version of our distributed rendering system for Blender. Let's dive in and take a look at what's new. So the first thing, this was a big request from one of our users. They wanted to be able to save the IP address of the computers they want to connect to. Now, this wasn't really possible, even though it kind of looked like it was possible in the previous versions. But the problem is, we overwrote that one IP address with a new one when you did certain things which meant that if you had saved one, it would get overwritten. And I don't want to go too deep into the weeds on IP addresses, but let's just say that was not a good thing. So now what we have instead is a list, and you can add as many of these as you want. Even better, if you know the host name of your computer, link in the description below if you don't know what a host name or an IP address is, by the way, then you should call your node or your computer that thing. So if you want to add a new computer, you can go add, and you can change its name. So I've added one called Ryzen Ninja, and when you press the connect button over here, it automatically already gives you a head start and it will populate as many IP addresses as our add-on can find. So our add-on basically does this cool trick where it talks to the network and go, has anyone seen Ryzen Ninja? Does anyone know his IP address? And then if there's any response, it saves those addresses in here and they're already there ready for you. And you can also add your own. So I'm gonna add, let's just imagine we've got another network interface inside our computer which allows us to plug another ethernet cable in it might have an address that looks like this i just made it up it's not a real one now that's saved so when i go back and look at the addresses you can see it sticks in here now i can even save this into the blend file so if i was to save a copy of this file and open it up again then that address will still be in there i'll just show you doing that now but i'll do a different thing i'll actually save my startup file so when I go and open a new startup file or a new scene, it's like general, no, don't save. If I come back and look at the lists, then that IP address is in there forever until you decide to delete it. So I'm just gonna delete that now because I don't want that one in there. And I can resave my startup file, open a new one, open a fresh session of Blender, and those IP addresses are saved. So there you go, job's done. You can now save as many IP addresses as you like. And what really helps with this is each one of those addresses will be used to try and connect to another computer on your network. And whichever one makes a connection first is used for the rest of the session and all the other ones are ignored. So you only need one that works and you can add as many as you have network cards in your computer. You might find if you use this method where you just press the connect button and let the add-on try and figure it out, you might find there's a whole bunch of addresses in here which look like they might work because they look like IP addresses, but some of these are just virtual networks which only exist on your computer and therefore none of the other computers in your home or office are connected to. So if you do have a preferred address and you know what you're doing, you can now add it. Okay, cool, so that's the first thing. The second thing is we've done a little bit of an overhaul to the UI. We've cleared up some rather confusing things. Like for example, our add-on has the ability to register itself to your cloud account. Your cloud account is what you created when you downloaded the add-on in the first place. You can actually log in through the add-on to that account and that does something rather special. It means that that computer which is logged in will now report that it is ready for a connection and it can do some rendering for you. And that shows up, well, it used to show up kind of weird in the old add-on in that everything would look kind of like it does here. But the problem is if a computer didn't do that, then it would be grayed out. The real issue though is disabling it for rendering would also make it look exactly the same. So we had this weird mix of, well, is it just offline or did I just click the camera? So now when a computer is not actually online, as far as we can tell, it will show this little broken link. And that means we're not sure. You could try connecting, but there's a good chance it won't work because unless you haven't logged into your cloud account, that machine doesn't seem to be on. And of course, logging each machine into your cloud account is completely optional. It will still work without it. You can still press this button. It will still try to connect. It's just that if it's off, then it's not gonna connect. You gotta turn it on first. And now when you press the camera button, it grays everything out as before. So a grayed out node just means that you've clicked the camera button. So this hopefully will just make it a bit clearer the difference between you decided you didn't wanna use that machine to render anything or it's not online and therefore you might wanna go and check that out. Next up, we did make some efforts to clean up our user interface, particularly this little menu here, which you access by pressing the little cog button. So obviously we've got the new list of IP addresses. This wasn't here before, so this is a new addition. And we also try to clean everything else up. I'll show you a little bit of a side-by-side -side comparison. So on the left is the old version, on the right is the new. 
I guess I'll leave it up to you guys to judge which you think is better. I think the one on the right is better because I spent quite a bit of time, you know, actually doing that. Let's go through some of the changes and the rationale behind it. So real quick, obviously you want to see all of the IP addresses that's relevant for that computer. You can edit them, you can add them and remove them. That didn't even exist in the previous version. The resynchronizing button. This actually tells Blender to send a fresh copy just to that computer. There is a button to do every single computer if you want, and that's down here. But now there's also this button here, which will do just that one individual machine, which is kind of handy if that machine hasn't been around, hasn't been online for a while and your file has changed. You can just hit that button and it will send a fresh snapshot off to that computer to replace the existing copy of the blend file. Then we've got some other stuff. We just laid this out a bit better. I think it's just a little bit more of a tighter UI. It's a bit narrower and hopefully it is easier to read. So real quick, we've got for cycles rendering, you can select what devices you actually wanna use. So you can select the GPU and then which particular device like optics, um, HIP, metal, depending on what you know platform you're on. Then you can also change the tile sizing. So cycles allows you to use different tile sizes. The default one is usually around 2000-ish pixels square, I believe. And that seems to be a really good size for GPUs. You can select smaller sizes, although I've noticed that that doesn't yield much of a performance benefit, but it does drop the memory usage a bit. So if you get into trouble with running out of memory, then a smaller tile size might really help. Finally, if you're gonna use the CPU for rendering, you can change the threads mode. This just means that, well, I'll show you. Auto detect means it'll just use all the threads it can find. Um, fixed means you can set a number of threads you want that CPU to use. Now, why wouldn't you use everything? Um, well, if you're in, let's just say, a computer lab that's being used by other people, you m might, might want to respect other people's user experience and just use a few threads rather than everything. Um, or you might just not care and just go for it. Full send. Up to you, really. Although, if you don't want to get in trouble with the people that own the lab, um, I probably would not be doing that. But again, it's up to you. So the next thing is we had another UI slowdown. Those of you who've been following our project for a while have noticed we've had at least two patches to improve UI performance. 066 is no different, it comes with another one. So we found that there was something that I had done that was not that smart, and now I fixed it. So you should know if you've had a slow user interface in Blender that's gone away mysteriously when you've turned the add-on off, and um, there should be some improvements to that now, particularly if you're using add-ons which export the scene to do something in background. We had one user who reports that this fix has made a dramatic improvement to exporting when using flip fluids. Flip fluids is a physics simulation for fluids, water, smoke, that kind of stuff. When you were exporting the scene, that was particularly slow. Now it's a lot better. So if you're exporting stuff to, I don't know, Flip Fluids or to Houdini or who knows what else, any exporter which plays through your animation frame by frame in the timeline in Blender may be a lot better now when crowd is enabled. And we come to the last improvement and that's to do with installation. So installation has changed since version 064. We used to bundle everything that the add-on needed, all the software into one package, and it wasn't terribly big, but the other issue was it was kind of hard for us to support all the platforms that Blender can run on. So what we do now instead is we have a script that runs when you click the install or the enable button. Actually, it's the enable button. And that goes and installs all of the dependencies for our project. Now, what do you mean by dependencies, James? Well, I'll go and show you what I mean by that. So let me find my user folder. Sorry, I'm on Windows 11 and it has done a number on me being able to navigate places. So this is our folder we put in your user folder when you install the add-on and we put all of the dependencies in here. So this is all the stuff that we use because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So for example, we have things like um, making requests to stuff on the internet. Um, there are other Python projects that have been well engineered, well tested, and we don't need to design our own package for that. So we actually use these ones and all of these are open source. You can go find them and look through them if you want to. The problem though is that other add-ons also installed their own copies of the same library. I believe Mo I believe Rococo's motion capture add-on does this. And the problem with that is we have actually specified a specific version. And what was happening is when you click the enable button, we try to go and grab our version and it accidentally would go and grab the one from Rococo. And unfortunately that broke the add-on. So what we've done is we've updated the software to only look 
in this location and that has fixed the issue. Well, that's version 066. There's a link in the description where you can go and get it. Um, you do need to be subscribed at the pro level or above in order to do that. And I guess this is the part of the video where we go, you know, like, share, subscribe. But I think what's better is actually comment. Tell us what it is you want. Tell us what it is you think. That information really helps. So long as you're nice, please don't be mean. It doesn't help anybody, even if it does feel cathartic. And I've run out of stuff to say now, so see you later.